Hello, everyone. In this video, I want to ask a very simple and direct question. I'm not sure it's simple to answer, but here it is. Did the Apostle Paul believe that Jesus was God? Question mark. Now, obviously, evangelical Christians, Orthodox Christians, Catholic Christians, all of the mainstream great church, as we call it, would say absolutely yes, because Jesus is, in fact, God, the second person of the Trinity, and the entire Christological Christian package that developed. But many readers of the Bible and students of the Bible, as well as most scholars, would agree that there's a development going on within the New Testament documents. So where does Paul fit into that development? this exaltation of the person of Jesus of Nazareth. So I want to begin with uh, just mentioning a few books. Uh, I put six up here. I could choose another six very easily, but some of these will be known to you, perhaps others not. I would recommend any and all of these for delving into this question, did Paul believe Jesus was God? Bart Ehrman, How Jesus Became God, The Exaltation of a Jewish Preacher from Galilee. James Dunn, Christology in the Making, A New Testament Inquiry into the Origins of the Doctrine of the Incarnation. Bart's books tend to be more popular, easy to read, accessible to a general audience, Dunn, who passed away a few years ago, a friend of many of us, uh, a great scholar, tending to be on the evangelical side of things. But in this wonderful book, he examines the entire New Testament and concludes that no one in the New Testament thought Jesus was God in the way that Christianity later declared. And Paul in particular, he would say, no, and we'll get into that. Barry Wilson, How Jesus Became Christian. That's a broader question, but it essentially is the same thing. Paula Friedrichson's famous book, very important book. This is the second edition, From Jesus to Christ. There's also that wonderful PBS series that she was instrumental in producing along with others which has the same title, From Jesus to Christ. And the whole idea is, how do you go from the person Jesus, the historical figure of Jesus, to you are the Christ, the Son of God, worthy of worship, or even more, you are in fact God incarnate in the flesh, or God becoming a man, as it's often popularly put. Uh, this book, Kermit Zarley, uh, The Restitution, Biblical Proof Jesus is Not God. Kermit is a professional golfer. He's not a professional academic or Bible student. I think he might be retired now. But for decades, he studied this question and published this very substantial book that goes thoroughly into all of the questions from a very committed evangelical Christian viewpoint. He's lost a lot of friends. He recently put out this smaller volume that I'll put in the description for those who don't want to do hundreds of pages, uh, The Gospel Corrupted When Jesus Was Made God. So keep that in mind as well. But I would recommend, in terms of really delving into the question, the big book, you might say, the, the restitution, he calls it. And then Maurice Casey, who's now passed away also, uh, From Jewish Prophet to Gentile God, The Origins and Developments of New Testament Christology. Morris Casey was a British scholar. He studied with C.K. Barrett. Uh, he's very well known in the field. And this is a wonderful, slim book, but very well worth studying. Every New Testament scholar has dealt with this question. This is just a sampling for your reading if you want to go deeper into this question. Everyone doesn't agree with what I'm going to present, but many do. So I'm not trying to summarize for you mainstream scholarship, 
but to give you my take on the question. Let's start with some caveats and some explanations because this gets very complex even as a question just to say, was Jesus God? First thing you want to ask is, what do you mean by God? So first of all, keep in mind, we're working from Greek, the Greek New Testament. Always have a copy here on my desk. This is the one I've had since grad school. Worn it out reading it. Uh, and also within that Greek text, there are variants. If I open this up for you and put it up close to the screen, you can see there that at the bottom of every page are all kinds of uh, variant readings from other manuscripts and so forth. Bart Ehrman has written a great deal about that. And you're moving from Greek to English, which also has to do with translation and how do you render or represent in English what you think the Greek is saying. It's not an easy task, but we all work on it, those of us who've studied Greek and studied the New Testament in Greek. But also just terminology. What do people mean by the terms, particularly in English? So here are some things to keep in mind before we go into Paul specifically. There's a difference between calling Jesus the Son of God versus God the Son, the Trinitarian idea. This idea of God in three persons, blessed Trinity, as the old song goes. So that you need to keep in mind, because Son of God is used in a variety of ways, even for just human beings. For example, in Luke's genealogy of Jesus, Luke chapter 3 in the New Testament, he gives this long list of Jesus' ancestors, and he finally ends with Adam, goes all the way back to Adam in Genesis, and he says, the Son of God. So he calls Adam the Son of God. Actually, that means something to Paul, as we're going to see. Then you have the terms divine and divinity. People have often asked me as a professor, just as a biblical scholar, uh, Dr. Tabor, do you believe Jesus is, usually they say the Son of God, but sometimes they say, do you think he's divine? Or what about the divinity of Jesus? And with that is also the idea of worship or homage, sort of bowing down in reverence to a certain being that usually is reserved in the Bible, Old Testament or Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, for the Creator God. But in Paul, uh, you bow the knee before Jesus as Lord, which is a different idea than the one God. And then you have the ancient debate that leads to the Nicene Creed and the other creeds of early Christianity in the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries. If Jesus is God, or if he's the Son of God, is he eternal? That is, did he always exist like God, therefore is truly God? Or was he created and exalted? One is the Orthodox view. I don't mean Greek Orthodox, but the Orthodox Christian view of the creeds. Mm -hmm. The other was championed particularly by a church leader or scholar named Arian. And Arian argued that although Jesus has been exalted to heaven, that he was a created being, that there was a time when he was not, is the thing that the Arians would affirm Whereas God, the one God of the Hebrew Bible, the God of the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, Yahweh or Jehovah, the one God is eternal forever. So in the creeds, you begin to say that he is God of gods, begotten, not made. In other words, there was not a time when he was not. That's the ultimate Trinitarian view. Then you've got the idea of maybe Jesus being an agent of God, and these are not exclusive, they overlap, or the image of God or the reflection of God. This is the idea that although Jesus is a human being, he's so filled with God's spirit that when you encounter Jesus, you in effect encounter God, meaning divinity manifested in the flesh. Now that's a little different from divinity in the flesh. That is, Jesus is eternal God, and he becomes flesh, which is usually called the incarnation or the logos Christology. 
So let, let me give you an example uh, from the book of Hebrews. Uh, the book of Hebrews is often said to be one of Paul's letters. It doesn't claim to be that. Uh, it does seem to be Pauline in some of its ideas. But in the opening of Hebrews, you get a good sense of this agent image or reflection of God. It starts out talking about God spoke of old to the fathers by the prophets. Okay, that's the Hebrew Bible. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by a son. So here, Jesus is the spokesman of God and a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, meaning he used Jesus to create the world. So the book of Hebrews is certainly claiming that Jesus pre-existed as a divine being. He reflects the glory of God, notice reflects, and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by the word of his power. And he's become much superior to angels and so forth. That's the opening of the book of Hebrews. So the idea of reflecting God. Now that's tricky because if you reflect God perfectly, are you then sort of becoming God? It's what we call an ontological question that theologians get into. So that's some of the scrambled egg terminology that people get into when they ask these questions. So what I intend by my title, that Paul believed Jesus was God, is fully God, eternal, one with the Father, and in fact, the God of the Hebrew Bible becoming a man, because that's the common Christian view. Did Paul believe anything even close to that? Okay, second caveat, besides translation and terminology, just to think about, primary sources for Paul, seven letters. These are the early letters. These are the letters that scholars universally agree, by and large, are the most authentically verified as coming from Paul. First Thessalonians, his earliest letter, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, Romans, Philippians, and Philemon. So we have to distinguish these seven letters from some secondary letters that Paul's language shows up in, but we're not sure he authored them in final form as we have them today. Ephesians and Colossians, and even more removed perhaps from Paul and his own thought, so that's what I'm doing in this video. I'm restricting my consideration. When I say Paul, I mean Paul within these seven letters that scholars refer to as early or authentic Paul. And then you've got the book of Acts where Paul is quoted all the time, but it's not Paul writing. And the book of Hebrews that again seems to be kind of Pauline, but it's not directly Paul. So Laying that groundwork, we'll take a look at the text. Uh, here are three texts I want us to start with. These are very definitive. Let's start with the earliest letter Paul wrote, and how does he describe Gentiles turning to the Jesus movement? Becoming Christian is one way of saying it. And he's talking about what fellow Thessalonians are reporting to him about the welcome we had among you. So he had been there. He'd raised up this little congregation at Thessalonica in Greece. And here's how he summarizes what people are saying. That is, how do you describe these new Jesus followers? That they have turned to God from idols. You know, whether we're talking about Corinth or Athens or Thessalonica or Ephesus or any of these Greek cities where Paul set up congregations, basically they're full of temples, which from a Jewish point of view is a form of idolatry. And so you turn to God, but not just God in general, like you pick another deity. You turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. That is a Jewish affirmation that other gods are not living and they're not true. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. 
Now, Paul certainly believes that Jesus is the Son of God, as we're going to see, and he's been exalted to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God, and he's the one who's going to return and administer the final judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, it's called in Paul's letters, and he will judge the world. But those who repent of their sins, who turn to the one God right here from idols, and accept Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, uh, and raised from the dead, they'll be delivered from the wrath to come, this wrath of God that's being poured out. You can also read Romans 1 because it begins with that. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness and so forth. So that's pretty clear. There's God, there are idols, the living and true God, and his Son, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? 1 Corinthians 8, 4, he's talking about idol temples and so forth in this chapter, and he's concerned that people are giving up idols, but still may be participating in some things having to do with temples in these various Greek cities, like maybe eating meat that has been offered in a temple and then sold in the local marketplace, like at Corinth. And there's archaeology even kind of illustrating that because they found the ruins of the Makelon, the meat market, and the idea that you would sell this meat that's been offered to these gods. Is that okay, or is that like participating in idolatry? And Paul takes a pretty liberal view. But later in this letter, in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, he does warn that even though he's taking a position that an idol has no existence, so you, why should you really worry about it, that you shouldn't eat at table in an idol's temple because there are demonic forces that are in that temple, and you don't want to take any kind of sacred meals or anything of that sort that would represent worship of an idol. But anyway, let's stay with this for now. So he says, look, we know... Uh, everybody knows, he means we Jews and all those who've accepted the true and living God, that an idol has no real existence. They're not real. They're not true. And there's no God but one. So here he's affirming this fundamental kind of affirmation of Judaism. For although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, and indeed many gods and many lords, Caesar's call Lord, kurios, Lord, that you would bow to somebody and say, my Lord, but more than just a polite term, it is a worshipful term. Yet for us, meaning the movement, the Jesus movement, there is one God, the Father. So he calls him the Father, one God, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. So this is the creator God of Genesis 1. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, that's the Greek word kurios again, one master, boss, basically in English, Jesus, his name, the Messiah, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The through whom in Paul means the new Adam. In other words, he believes there are two creations. There's one God, the Father, the first creation, Genesis 1, and now there's a new creation, and through Jesus, this new creation, this second Adam, is being implemented and brought into existence. So he believes that his followers have been begotten by the Holy Spirit and are also sons of God. Paul talks in Romans 8, I'm not going to go into it today, but he talks about the many sons of God or children of God that are followers, and that Jesus is the firstborn of a family of beings called sons of God. Uh, and through him, others are brought into existence. And then we've got Romans 1, which is Paul's most systematic exposition of what he calls his gospel. And here he says, my gospel, the gospel, concerning his son, that's Jesus, of course, who was descended from David according to the flesh. So he's a human being, according to Paul, and he has a human pedigree from the line of David, 
but he's been designated or marked off. It's this Greek word, horizo, declared. It can also be translated son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. There you have the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what he's saying here is that Jesus, when he was raised from the dead in this glorified state that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 with this new glorified body, he becomes the first of many to follow. And Paul believed at the parousia or the appearance of Jesus, when he comes back to judge the world, he will raise those in Christ into these new bodies, and they will become the glorified sons of God. You can read Romans 8 for that. So Jesus is a human being, but he's been marked off or declared or designated son of God in power by this resurrection of the dead. But he believes that those who are begotten of God, an impregnation of the Holy Spirit, where a new life begins to grow inside the old life, that those human beings are also going to become sons of God. So Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, you might say. So these three seem pretty clear. I, I don't think Paul is mixing up the one God of Genesis 1 with Jesus of Nazareth, and he does believe that he's been exalted and glorified as a son of God, but he also says that about the followers in the future. So whatever he believes about the followers, he also believes about Jesus and vice versa. So let's look at three more passages, and these three are often quoted and referred to by those who want to say, yes, Jesus is God, meaning the eternal one God, the creator, became a man. The first one is Romans 9, 5. He's talking about the Israelites or the Jewish people, as they're sometimes called, the ancient Israelites. To them belong all of these things, like the giving of the law and the covenant and so forth. And one of the things he mentions is the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And from them, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, according to the flesh comes the Messiah, who is overall God bless forever. Amen. So this has a kind of liturgical feeling to it. But you're going to find in some translations, and here's where you get into the English problem, a punctuation variation. It's not a different Greek reading. It's how you punctuate the Greek. So you could say, comes the Messiah, who is God overall, bless forever. So you're calling Jesus God, basically. And uh, I don't believe Paul ever calls Jesus God. You saw in those three opening passages, there's one God and one Lord. Or may he who is God overall be blessed forever. So either this translation or this translation, I think, is the clear meaning. So from him comes the Messiah, period. And then what you say is, as a kind of liturgical blessing, who is overall God bless forever, or may he who is God overall be blessed forever. That's, I think, the understanding of that passage. So it doesn't affirm Jesus as God in that later developed Trinitarian sense. First Corinthians 10, Paul gives a allegory. He says that in the Hebrew Bible, the Israelites, our fathers, he calls them, or under this cloud, this glory of God, it's called the Kavod. They pass through the sea, remember when they crossed the Reed Sea, and they were in effect baptized to Moses. Just as the ancient Israelites were saved by passing through water from Pharaoh, who would have captured and killed them, presumably, during the time of Moses, and then they ate the same supernatural food, remember the manna, and drank the same supernatural drink. Well, what is the supernatural drink, food and drink that they ate? Well, the manna from heaven and water from the rock. For they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. So there are people who would say, see, Jesus is Christ. 
and he's that rock that followed them. And actually, we have no record of a rock following them, unless you refer to God as the rock or the cloud as the rock. But there is the rock that Moses struck, remember, and water came out of it at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. But this is an analogy. In other words, uh, he's just saying, just as ancient Israelites were baptized and ate spiritual food and trusted in the rock, we today are baptized into Christ, eat the Last Supper. He's primarily talking about in this very next chapter, chapter 11, he talks about the bread and the wine. You can go back and listen to a previous video I did last time on that about being washed in the blood and eating and drinking the body and the blood of Jesus. That's what he's referring to here. But it's an analogy. And the rock that gave them this water was Christ. So uh, that's not really a statement cosmologically that Jesus is somehow the God of the Old Testament. And it's very common for people to say today when they read the Hebrew Bible that the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps, yod Hey vav Hey in Hebrew, Yehovah or Jehovah or Yahweh, that that's Jesus Christ already appearing in the Hebrew Bible, but not yet made flesh. But I don't think this verse is affirming that. And I think Paul would be appalled, to use a bad pun, for people to be calling Jesus the one God who delivered Israel from Egypt. That's pretty clear in the opening lines of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord, Jehovah or Yahweh, your God. You will have no other gods besides me or before me. And countless affirmations throughout the Hebrew Bible, I am the Lord, one, there's none beside me, no partners with God. But a Lord who's exalted to heaven, Paul did believe that about Jesus. But remember, he's the first of many who are to follow. And then 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul's talking about raising money for poor followers of Jesus, the poor saints, he calls them. And he gives Jesus as an example that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that by his poverty you might become rich. Well, we're going to look at that in the next slide, what that really means. But I don't think it means he was in heaven existing as God, and then he was incarnate and became a man, and therefore he became poor, he gave up his divinity and became a man. I think the idea here is pretty simple. Of I'm going to turn to Mark 10, where you get this idea. Jesus is proclaiming the arrival of the kingdom of God, but if you want to follow him, he tells the disciples, the apostles, and all of his followers that you got to sell what you have and give to the poor. That's in the earliest strata of Jesus' material. And there's an occasion in Mark chapter 10, verse 28, where Peter began to say to him, when they're talking about riches, this very subject of money, people who have means, lo, we've left everything and followed you. And look what Jesus says, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or land even for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So according to the gospel of Mark, and I think this reflects the historical figure of Jesus. He expects the kingdom of God to come before the age to come, where you get eternal life, the kind of eternal state beyond this world, beyond the judgment. But he believes that during this kingdom of God, Christians sometimes call it the millennium, they will receive all of these things that they gave up. But in the meantime, you become poor, you give up what you have. Now, does it mean Jesus was filthy rich, as we say? That doesn't seem to be the case. But he certainly had a livelihood, and he had a life, and he had a place in the world, brothers, sisters, family, land, and so forth. And he called upon people to give all that up. 
and to create this new egalitarian group that would manifest and reflect the kingdom of God, rich and poor, slave and free, male and female, Jew and Gentile, and so forth. So I think that's what he's talking about, and that's the context, if you read the context. I don't think it's talking about any kind of Trinitarian incarnation. It doesn't fit. Okay, now we come to a very important passage, and this is the passage that most often is referred to as proof or an indication that Paul believed Jesus was God, that he was divine, that he was preexistent in heaven with God, and he gave it all up and became a man. And in most English translations, you could easily get that idea. But many New Testament scholars, James Dunn is the one that I first encountered this from and got convinced of by him in his book, Christology in the Making. I have two books on Paul, Paul and Jesus, and the second book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, which I published not too many years ago. And I have a whole section in the book on this where I give all the notes and so forth. And if you get this book, you'll get the full view of what I say, but I'll give you a summary here. The idea of an Adam Christology is that Paul is working with two Adams. The first man, Adam, is the Genesis Adam. And by Adam, we mean humankind, who became a living, breathing being, nefesh kaya in Hebrew. So he is a physical being. Animals are also called the same thing in Hebrew, living being, nefesh, a breather, a living breather, literally. But the last Adam, in this case, Jesus, but remember, he's the head of a race or group of these new Adams, became a life-giving spirit. And that's from 1 Corinthians 15. And the reference to a life-giving spirit is his resurrection that he's transformed from flesh and blood to a spirit being with a new spiritual body, as Paul calls it, a wind body, literally. But it's glorious, it's eternal, it's full of power, and so forth. And he promises that those who belong to Christ will get also transformed. And it's the word metamorpho, like we get metamorphosis from that word. Paul believes when Jesus returns, God, not Jesus, God will transform our lowly bodies, our flesh and blood, bodies of dust, as Paul calls it, into life-giving spirits. And the indication of that, or you might say the proof of that, is that he believes he saw the glorified risen Christ, and he believes that's the destiny of all the followers, that God is bringing many sons into glory. So let's look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Notice it starts out, have this mind among yourselves. In other words, think like this, which is the mind you'll have if you're focusing on the Messiah, Christ, that is Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grass. Now, that's usually taken as He's in heaven with God eternally. He is God, and he gave all that up. He emptied himself and took the form of a servant. But let's go down here to Genesis 1, and remember that in Genesis 1, 26 through 27, humans are male and female, made in the image and likeness of God, but not equal to God, remember? And they're told that there is this certain fruit we call it the forbidden fruit that they're not to eat. They're not told why by God. But the nakash, often equated to Satan, but literally the shining one, and he basically, he's the tempter. And he says, well, if you do eat that fruit, you'll be equal to God. You need to reach out and grasp that fruit, see? And then you'll be equal to God. So this is talking about the initial state of Jesus as a human being, of all of us as a human being. It's, it's not just Jesus. It's just that Jesus is the first. He's in the form of God. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grass. I'm going to send to heaven. I'm going to be God. But he emptied himself. 
taking the form of a servant, that literally a slave, and being in the likeness of men. There's the form and the likeness. Uh, words like morphe is one of the words. In the Greek version of Genesis 126, you also have some of this vocabulary, which parallels very well. And being found in a human role, that is, he took on the life of a human being, literally the schema, the, the lifestyle, he humbled himself, so he becomes a slave and becomes a human in the role of one who is a servant and becomes obedient to death, but all the way to death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. So because he was in the form of God, but didn't grasp equality with God, he's going to get it as a gift. And he receives, it's bestowed on him, a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So God is the one who exalts Jesus and gives him this name. And so when people bow to Jesus, as I think Paul probably did, reverence Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, he's become divine, you might say. Now, is he God? He's clearly not God the Father. He's pictured as sitting at the right hand of God. But then in some of the passages of the New Testament, we have reference to Jesus saying, if you overcome, if you follow the right way, if you follow this pattern, I will allow you to sit on my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So the idea, it's obviously symbolic language, sitting on a throne in heaven, but the idea of authority and power and rule and equality with God. And in Genesis 3, remember, the forbidden fruit makes one equal to God, and they grasp and aid it. But equal to God doesn't mean you become God. It means you receive the glory and the power and the immortality of God as a gift, which flesh and blood human beings do not have. But if they're transformed by this resurrection, by this transformation, by this metamorphosis, they will become like Jesus became the life-giving spirit. So for Paul, this is the way of salvation for Jesus and for all who would follow. And that fits in with the gospel of Mark. If anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up a cross, become the least, become a servant. In other words, join me in my role as a suffering servant as an example, have this mind among yourselves. You should give it all up. You should become a slave. You should become a servant. So you see how this actually all fits together. It's very consistent. As far as other passages, within those seven letters, we've covered them. And we looked at three main ones, which I think make clear what Paul really thought. And three passages that often are referred to as well as a fourth Philippians chapter two, uh, to say, oh, no, no, Paul believed in something like the Trinity. The thing to remember about Paul is he's all fired up with this idea that flesh and blood human beings can become these glorified spirit beings that are called the children or the sons of God. And he believes Jesus is the first of many to come. Again, read Romans 8. So it's not like Jesus has it all, gives it all up, comes to earth, goes back, gets it all back with maybe more, and now he comes and gives it to you. It's rather that Jesus is the first of many to follow, that he was a man of dust, but he was transformed into a life-giving spirit with the spiritual body. So take care, everybody. I'm going to put in the description the previous two videos where I talk about where did Paul get his gospel, and is he the one who originated the idea that Christ, the Messiah, 
is to die for sins and sins are forgiven by being washed in his blood and so forth. Did that come from Paul or did Paul receive it from the apostles who went before him and he's just passing it on? So you might want to hear those two. These three go together and I think they form a very coherent unit. See you next time.